Okay, so. Just one second. All right. Okay, so welcome everybody. We're we're on YouTube now, so let me just Okay, and let me Okay, let us pray and we'll begin our Bible study. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, once again for enabling us to have this Bible study. As we are in the midst of the season of Lent, please be with us and enable all of us to be uh, strong-willed so that we could keep whatever resolutions that we may have committed to at the beginning. Help us to keep the season of Lent godly and holy, and may we truly be able to live a life that is set apart uh, so that you may be pleased with our lives and that we may be able to glorify you with all of our words and our deeds. Father God, at this time, I pray that the Holy Spirit will be with us so that you could teach us of your word and that we may be able to not only learn it as head knowledge, but help us to apply this to our lives so that um, through the wisdom that you give to us, we may be able to live a life that is victorious in these end times. We thank you so much for your grace, and we pray all of these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ with thanksgiving. Amen. Okay, so welcome everybody. Uh, today's our third Bible study for the season of Lent. We have one more to go after this. Today we're going to study about uh, the 10 plagues and the time of his visitation. Ten plagues and the time of his visitation. So first we're going to read from Genesis chapter 50, verses 24 through 26. Let's read that real quick. So Genesis chapter 50, verses 24 through 26, right here. Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will surely take care of you and bring you up from this land to the land which he promised on oath to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely take care of you, and you shall carry my bones up from here. So Joseph died at the age of 110 years, and he was embalmed and placed in a coffin in Egypt. And this is the word of God. Amen. So this is uh, Joseph's final words before he died, okay, his final will and testament, right? And there's something that he emphasizes here. He says it twice. He says, I'm about to die and God will surely take care of you. Okay. And bring you up from this land. And then he also says again in verse 25, God will surely take care of you and you shall carry my bones up from here. So he says it twice. Take care of you here and here. What does that mean? Take care of you. In Hebrew, the word is pakad. Okay, pakad. And this word pakad has many different meanings. It's like one of the hardest words to translate. But one of those meanings is to visit. Okay, so when he says God will take care of you, basically what he's saying is God is going to visit you sometime in the future. Okay, I'm going to die. But God's going to visit you. And when he does, he's going to take you out of here back to Canaan. And when he does that, when he comes to visit you, carry my bones up from here. He made them swear it. Okay? He made them swear. Okay? So Joseph said, I mean, he was certain. He said, God is going to visit you someday. He's going to come, he's going to come down into Egypt and he's going to take you out. And that's what we call the Exodus, right? So that's why uh, we're going to talk about the 10 plagues and the time of his visitation. The, when the exodus took place, when the exodus took place, 
That was basically the time of God's visitation upon Israel. And in order for the exodus to happen, what did he need to do first? He needed to bring the 10 plagues on Egypt first because Pharaoh had hardened his heart, right? So this also was part of God's visitation upon Israel. Okay. So let's look at how, uh, how, uh, how God signaled his time of visitation to the people. If you go to Acts chapter 7, verse 17 through 19, this is what it says. But as the time of the promise was approaching, which God had assured to Abraham, the people increased and multiplied in Egypt until there arose another king over Egypt who knew nothing about Joseph. It was he who took shrewd advantage of our race and mistreated our fathers so that they would expose their infants and they would not survive. See that? It says, as the time of the promise was approaching. That's the time that God promised to Abraham. Okay. God promised to Abraham that the Israelites would suffer for 400 years in Egypt. And then God will take them out, right? So no human being was counting this because, you know, 400 years, that's a long time. That's more than a, a lifetime of a person. So people had died, so they forgot. But God was counting. And he was counting exactly to the day. And he was seeing, oh, now the time has come. So he, the time of the promise was approaching. So he sets things into motion, right? He makes the people increase and multiply. And that makes this new king who knows nothing about Joseph get anxious, right? Because he's thinking these slaves are our enemies. If they get bigger than us, if they, they get more, become more numerous than us, then they're going to take over. So he starts to mistreat them really hard, harshly. And then what does that do? That made the people pray more, right? In Exodus chapter 2, verse 23 through 25. It says this, now it came about in the course of those many days that the king of Egypt died and the sons of Israel sighed because of the bondage and they cried out and their cry for help because of their bondage rose up to God. So God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God saw the sons of Israel and God took notice of them. See that? So God put all these things into motion. First, God makes them increase in number. He makes them fruitful. And then he brings a new king over Egypt. And that, because of the, the increasing of the Israelites, he gets all nervous and he treats them really bad. And that makes the Israelites pray and cry out to God. And then God is sort of like pretending, like as if he didn't know. It's like, oh, okay, you're praying to me. But he made them pray, right? But he's saying, oh, you're praying to me, so now I'll hear your prayers, and I'll remember the covenant. And the last verse says, God saw the sons of Israel, and God took notice of them. He took care of them, just as Joseph said. Okay? This was the time of his visitation. So God was waiting for that right time, the time that he had promised. Okay? And then the action that he took in order to take the Israelites out of Egypt, that action is called the 10 plagues. That was God's intervention, okay, to save the Israelites. So we're going to look at these 10 plagues, but not just the 10 plagues, but we're going to connect that to the end times and to the time of Jesus, okay? And we're going to see how they are connected. And we're going to see how these 10 plagues are actually, actually did take place during Jesus' time and also during our time as well. Okay, so let's look at them uh, by order. Number one, Jesus, uh, God turned water into blood, right? So basically, this is the Nile River which was a god to the Egyptians. They worshiped the Nile, okay? It was their god. It was their life-giving source. Okay. 
Okay, this Nile River, the, the water from the Nile was their life-giving source. Okay, without it, they would die. And what did God do? He turned that water into blood. Okay, now blood has two meanings, dual meaning, right? Blood sim symbolizes life. That's what Leviticus chapter 17, oops, chapter 17, verse 11 says. It says, because there's life in the blood, you could use, you could shed blood to make atonement for your sins. But on the other hand, blood also signifies death. Why? Because when the blood is inside your body, it's life. But when it comes out of your body, it's death, right? When you lose blood, you die, right? So it has dual meaning. So the fact that water turned into blood means that this life-giving source now became death for the Egyptians. Why did God do this? And one of the immediate reasons why he did this was because the Egyptians killed the Israelite babies in the Nile. They shed a lot of blood in this river. So God is now taking vengeance upon them. By this, by turning the water into blood. Okay. So this is a judgment upon, this is God's judgment upon the gods of Egypt. Who are the gods of Egypt? Like Pharaoh and many of the animals, they worshiped animals. The Nile River was a god of Egypt. But let's connect this today. Who is the God of gods of today? Whatever we uh, receive, you know, whatever we feel is a life-giving source, that's what we worship. That's what water symbolizes. It's a life-giving source, right? So people whose lives are dependent upon money, they worship money. The God of money is called mammon, right? And Jesus clearly said, you can't serve God and mammon at the same time. Some people, you know, worship themselves. Then pride becomes their God. Some people worship knowledge or pleasure or what have you. We have all kinds of gods. And God is going to judge all of those things. In the end times, in the book of Revelation, when God judges Babylon, it basically, we could sum up the gods of Babylon as three. The god of wealth. Okay, Babylon was a very rich country, and everybody made a lot of money off of them. But then it got destroyed in one day, and everybody was destroyed along with it, right? Second is the God of pride, human pride, okay? They took pride in their own ability to bring salvation upon themselves. Human beings, they thought, we don't need God because we have all the ability to save ourselves. And the third is the God of immorality. Many people worship just this immoral, pleasurable ways of life. Hedonism, you know, they did whatever felt good. Okay, And God said, God is going to judge all of that in the end times. Now, Jesus performed a similar act when he turned water into wine. Okay. In fact, that was the first miracle that Jesus performed, right? Just as water into blood is the first of the 10 plagues, Jesus' first miracle was turning water into wine. So what does this mean? Well, wine later Jesus likened to his own blood, right? And during the Last Supper, he gave his disciples wine to drink, and he said, this is my blood poured out for you as a sign of the new covenant. Okay. And Jesus' blood is a life-giving blood. Because he shed his blood so that we don't have to shed our own blood. So his blood became life-giving, a source of life-giving source for us. But the water back then, the waters of the world were already tainted. They, they were already death. 
So the fact that Jesus turned water into wine symbolizes the fact that Jesus, if you trust in Jesus, if you believe in Jesus, if you are in Jesus, this death-giving source of water will be turned into life-giving wine. Okay, So Jesus reversed the plague. If you're in Jesus, the plague gets reversed. Number two, the second um, plague, plague was the plague of frogs. Okay, Frogs came up from the Nile and went into every house, every place. You know, it was everywhere, in the kitchens, in the food bowls, in the bedrooms, in the Pharaoh's palace. It was everywhere. Frogs everywhere. Okay. Frogs are very dirty and frogs are very loud, right? And it brings chaos. So what does this mean? Well, in the New Testament, frogs symbolize unclean spirits. Okay. So let's look at Revelation chapter 16, verses 13 and 14. So it says, And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs. For they are spirits of demons, performing signs which go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for the war of the great day of God, the Almighty. So you see, it says the three unclean spirits are like frogs, right? They're likened to frogs. So frogs symbolize three unclean spirits. And what kind of spirits are these unclean spirits? These are deceiving spirits. Okay, so they deceive the kings of the world to gather them for this war so that they will all be destroyed. Okay. Now, when Jesus came on the scene, many people were possessed by unclean spirits. And Jesus drove out those unclean spirits, right? Let's look at Mark chapter one, verse 23. Just then there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit and he cried out saying, what business do we have each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked them saying, be quiet and come out of him. Throwing him to convulsions, the unclean spirit cried out with a loud voice and came out of him. See that? Jesus drove out unclean spirits. Okay? So if you're in Christ, the unclean spirits cannot touch you. But outside of Christ, the unclean spirits were already in the world when Jesus came on the scene. This unclean spirit was already in this man. So it wasn't Jesus bringing the plagues. The plagues were already there. Okay? So the plagues are a precursor to the time of his visitation. When Jesus came into this world, that was the time of his visitation. So these plagues were already out there. Okay, that's what we could see. And Jesus came to drive them out, right? So in the end times, the Bible says, as we read from Revelation 16, verses 13 and 14, in the end times, there will be another time when these frog-like unclean spirits or deceiving spirits will be sent out into the world. And when you receive the spirit, you will believe in the lies. You will be deceived by the untruth. You'll be deceived by the lies that this world uh, tells us. But if we are in Christ, he will drive out those unclean spirits. He will protect us from uh, those unclean spirits so that we will understand the truth. Okay. So let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Oh, I'm sorry, 2 Thessalonians. So this is talking about the Antichrist here, okay? When the Antichrist comes, it says that is the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders. So the Antichrist will come and perform all these signs, right? And with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence 
so that they will believe what is false. So this is sort of like the plague of the frog. If you do not receive this radio, the love of the truth. See, you have to receive that. It's not something that you have or you could just get whenever you want. You have to receive that from God. That's God's grace. The fact that we're here gathered on a Tuesday night, Bible studying on Zoom, I, I hope and believe that this is a sign that says that we have received this love of the truth. So that the truth of the word of God seals us so that the deluding influence here will not affect us so that we will not believe what is false, but we will love the truth and follow the truth and stand with the truth. See, why did God do this? Verse 12, in order that they may all be judged who did not believe the truth, but took pleasure in wickedness. See that? If you continue to resist the truth of God's word, not believe in it, God gives you many chances. And if you keep resisting, what happens? Then God sends this deluding influence. And he takes away the love of the truth so that you don't believe in that. Right? So we need to receive this word when we have the opportunity. So that's what the, the plague of the, the frogs is about. Number three is the plague of gnats. Sometimes known as lice. So what happened in this plague? Well, God told Moses to throw some dust in the air. And this dust turned into gnats. And it landed on man and beast. And it really it, it bit them. And it stung them. And it sucked blood out of them. Okay. So here, the word dust... The word dust in Hebrew is afar, which is the same word used in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. When God created man from the dust of the ground and breathed into him the breath of life, he became a living being, right? That dust of the ground, same word is afar. So dust in the Bible, afar, this word symbolizes man minus the breath of life. Okay? Because in Genesis 2-7, God took the dust, he added breath of life into it, and he became a living being. Right? So dust is, if you subtract the breath of life, all you have is dust. And the breath of life we have learned is the spirit of God, right? So man who does not have the spirit of God. Man who's lost the spirit of God is at the level of the dust. And that dust becomes gnats. But also in Genesis chapter 3, verse 14, this dust, the Bible says, is food for serpents. When God cursed the serpent, he said, dust will be food for you all the days of your life. So, in other words, spiritually speaking, if we are at the level of the dust, we will become the serpent's food. We will be devoured by the serpent, by Satan. Well, that dust became gnats, and it became really annoying. It was like this thing that just sucks the blood out of you, sucks the life out of you, right? Okay. And this, again, is talking in a spiritual sense. We will notice that Plagues number two, three, and four. Frogs, gnats, and then number four is flies. These three are all related. They're all talking about unclean spirits, spirits of demons, evil spirits. Okay, these are deceiving spirits and evil spirits that is out there in the world. That we could get bit by and it will suck the life out of us. Okay, these spirits are out there. That's what the Bible is teaching us. That's what the gnats are. So in the New Testament, what happened with these gnats? Well, first of all, in Matthew chapter 10, verses 14 and 15, when Jesus sent out his disciples to evangelize, When Jesus sent out his disciples to evangelize, this is what he said. 
In verse 14, whoever does not receive you nor heed your words as you go out of that house or that city, shake the dust off your feet. Truly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. So if you go to a place, if you go to somebody's house, or if you go to a town or a city, and they don't receive you, they don't receive the gospel that you're preaching, Jesus said, shake the dust off your feet. This is a symbolic act. It's basically saying, you guys, you are like dust now. You are uh, deemed for judgment now because you refuse to receive the word of God. Right? So gnats are people that have been assigned to judgment. Okay. Let's go to number four. Four is flies, right? Or swarms of flies. Okay. Um, this appears in Exodus chapter eight, verses 30 or 20 to 32. The word, the Hebrew word for the swarms of flies is arov, which comes from erev, which also means like confusion, chaos. And from there, it developed to mean swarming, right? Like when you have a swarm of flies just flying around, it's very confusing, right? Chaotic, right? That's what it means. Okay. Now, there, there really is no other place where it talks about flies like that except here in the 10 plagues. But it does talk about, the Bible does talk about somebody else that's related to flies. And that's this God called Beelzebub. In the Old Testament, he's called Beelzebub. He was the God of Ekron, which is in the land of the Philistines. Okay. Why am I mentioning this guy? Beelzebub literally means Lord of the Flies, like, like the book. Okay. And then in the New Testament, this name gets becomes like uh, Greek. In the Greek, it is, whoops, it is Beelzebul. the same God, the king of the flies. But in Luke chapter 11, verse 15, he is called the ruler of demons. Okay, let's look at Luke 11, 15. So, but some of them said he casts out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. You know what this verse is talking about, right? Jesus was casting out demons, right? And his opponents, like the Pharisees and the religious leaders were saying, oh, you know, that guy, Jesus, he's casting out demons because he is the Beelzebub or he's using Beelzebub, the ruler of demons, to drive out demons. And Jesus answered him in verse 17, any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste and a house divided against itself falls. If Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say, I cast out demons by Beelzebub. And if I, by Beelzebub, cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast out? So they will be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So basically what Jesus is saying is, no, I'm not casting out demons by Beelzebub. I am casting him out by finger of God. And the kingdom of God has come upon you. Okay, so since Beelzebub was known as the Lord of the Flies, and in the New Testament, he is known as the ruler of demons, thus flies, spiritually speaking, symbolize demons or evil spirits, right? So like, just like the swarms of flies that just comes around, you know, and they're like flying around, buzzing around, and it's very confusing and chaotic, okay? The Bible is teaching us that in the end times, just before the coming of Christ, this world will be filled with demons like this. Evil spirits that are out there that we cannot see. That's what the Bible says. If we believe in the Bible, you have to believe in this too. Okay? 
but we can't see them, right? So we're not aware of that. But if you look in Revelation chapter 18, verse 2, it talks about Babylon, right? And he cried out with a mighty voice saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place of demons and a prison of every unclean spirit and a prison of every unclean and hateful bird. Right? And we've learned that Babylon symbolizes this world, right? That we're living in right now. So the Bible is saying this world is full of demons and unclean spirits in the end times. Right now, it's out there. Okay? And it's trying to deceive us. One of the main things that these, the demons and the unclean spirits do in the end times is it deceives people to stray away from God. Okay, so as I said, uh, frogs, gnats, and flies are very related. They're related to each other. They're all talking about some kind of spiritual beings like demons or unclean spirits or deceiving spirits. Okay, number five, then we had pestilence. Pestilence is in Exodus chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. So pestilence is like a contagious disease that came on the um, livestock of the Egyptians, on the animals. Okay, so there was it was a contagious disease on the animals, and it was it was only on the Egyptian animals. The livestock of the Israelites were spared. Okay. So what is this uh, play teaching us? Well, these livestock, like cows and sheep of the Egyptians, they were their gods. They worshipped these animals. So God was bringing judgment down upon the gods of Egypt. But also the word for pestilence in Greek is thanatos. Does that sound familiar? It's related to the word thanos. From the Avengers, right? And Thanatos means death. So, you know, like the Black, black Plague in the Middle Ages in Europe was called the Black Death, right? Um, so the plagues or pestilence was called Thanatos in Greek, which literally means death. Okay. And that same plague is also mentioned in Revelation chapter 6, verse 8. It says, I looked and behold, an ashen horse, and he who sat on it had the name Death, right? It's Thanatos. And Hades was following with him. Authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword, with famine, and with pestilence, and by the wild beasts of the earth, right? So what the one of the seals, the fourth seal here, is about death uh, through pestilence. So when Jesus came, Jesus put to death, death by his own death. Okay. Jesus put death to death. And that's why Apostle Paul says now, for those of us who believe in Jesus, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Verses 55 and the following, he says, Oh, death, where is your sting? See right here, Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, for those of us who are in Christ, just as God protected the livestock of the Israelites, those of us in Christ, are protected even from death. Okay. And then number six, number five, pestilence and six are also related. Number six is boils, boils. So pestilence was a contagious disease on the animals. Boils was a disease on human beings, on people. Boils is also called sores. 
Okay. So this was the first time in the plagues that actually threatened human life. These other plagues until now didn't really threaten human life, but this actually does. This boil sores can kill people. Okay. And this word boils or sores appears in the New Testament in Revelation chapter 16, verse 2. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and it became a loathsome and malignant sore on the people who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped his image. See that? This word sore is that very word, same word. In, he, in Greek, it's helkos. And who was this given to? When the first bowl of wrath was poured out, sores came on people who had the mark of the beast. That's 666, right? If you receive the mark of the beast, this malignant sore will grow on you. Helkos. Okay? So what does that mean? Does it, is it literally talking about this kind of disease, uh, boils or sores? Well, one of the characteristics of this disease is this. In verse 11, we're in Revelation chapter 16, verse 11 here. It says, and they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. So one of the characteristics of the people who have sores is that they refuse to repent. Even though it's so painful. You know, when you're in pain, you tend to, your heart tends to soften, right? And you want to repent. You want to seek forgiveness you want to pray right you know last week i had toothache it was so bad that i was literally like praying to god crying out to god because i was in such pain right but these people who have these sores it was very painful and yet they refused to repent why is that that's actually a, a, a characteristic of the sore Okay. Because in the Old Testament, boils, when boils developed, what did they turn into? They turned into leprosy. Okay, Let's look at Leviticus chapter 13, verses 18 through 25. Leviticus 13, 18 through 25. So, it says, when the body has a boil on its skin and it is healed, and in the place of the boil there's a white swelling or a reddish white bright spot, then it shall be shown to the priest. And then it says, if you look, if the priest looks at it and it's okay, then it's it's fine, then he's clean. But and the priest in verse 20 says, and the priest shall look and behold, if it appears to be lower than the skin and the hair on it has turned white, then the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is the infection of leprosy. It has broken out in the boil. See that? So boil could develop into a leprosy. And leprosy is an incurable disease. Can't cure it. So they had to be quarantined and they lived on their own separately. Okay, lepers, right? But what happened when Jesus came? Jesus healed lepers, right? Jesus was able to heal them. And they became completely clean. So when Jesus came on the scene, leprosy was prevalent. It was already there. But Jesus healed many lepers, right? So what is leprosy? Uh, a characteristic of leprosy is that the person who has leprosy cannot feel can't feel pain on the spot where the leprosy has broken out. So if you poke it with a needle, it may bleed. Sometimes your finger, you may cut it off. It may fall off and they don't feel anything. Their nose may fall off. They don't feel any pain. That's leprosy. So there's a spiritual leprosy. Where you sin. And when you sin, 
you feel pricked in your conscience, right? But if you continue to sin over and over and over and over and over again, then it, that starts to numb up and your conscience can't feel anything, right? So let's look at second. Tim oh, I'm sorry, First Timothy, chapter four, verses one and two. But the Spirit explicitly says that in later times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons by means of the hypocrisy of liars, seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron. See, when it says that they are seared in their own conscience with a branding iron. You know what a branding iron is, right? It's this iron that they put into the fire, gets really hot, it's red hot. And when you sear your skin or the animals hide with it, it burns that part so that it's the, the cells die and you can't feel anything on that part. So it says that their conscience has been seared like that. What happens if that happens? Your conscience can't feel anything. So these people become hypocrites. They lie like it's the truth. They sin and they don't feel any pain, right? They don't feel any guilt. And these are the ones who are spreading the deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. You see, we have been talking about these things, right? The frogs and the flies, they're all connected. When the frogs and the flies come upon you, then you may get boils, which leads to leprosy. Then you can't feel any guilt. You believe in the lies. You turn away from God and you are doomed for destruction. That's what the 10 plagues are all about. So when God brought about the sixth plague, and Pharaoh refused to repent in Exodus chapter 9, verse 12. It says something that we need to pay attention to. And the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not listen to them, just as the Lord had spoken to Moses. So here it says the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. Up to this point, it was Pharaoh hardening his own heart and not listening to God. But after the sixth plague, after the plague of boils, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. This is the first time that he did that. Even though way back at the beginning, he, God said, he prophesied saying, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. He was talking about the future. But this is the first moment where he's actually doing that. So in other words, after six plagues, God is saying, I have given enough chances for him to repent and listen to me. And it's over now. So from the seventh, now God is going to attack. It is his judgment. It's over. God will not let Pharaoh repent anymore. So that kind of matches up with the plague of boils, right? Because if boils develops, it becomes leprosy, then your conscience is hardened. You cannot repent. You can't feel any guilt. So Pharaoh has gotten to that point now. That's what this is telling us. And that same thing has happened. When Jesus came, when Jesus came on the scene, the Israelites received so much grace. They saw so many of signs from Jesus, right? He performed many signs, but what did they do? They still did not believe, right? So it says here in John chapter 12, verse 37, but though he had performed so many signs before them, yet they were not believing in him. So now what is Jesus going to do? In verse 38, he says, this was to fulfill the word of Isaiah, the prophet, which he spoke. Lord, who has believed our report and to whom has the arm of the Lord has been revealed? See, the arm of the Lord, that's Jesus. He's been revealed to Israel, right? But they would not believe in him. So what did they do? In verse 39, for this reason, they could not believe. For Isaiah said again, he has blinded their eyes, hardened their heart, so that they would not see with their eyes and perceive with their heart and be converted and I heal them. See? God said, I have given you enough chances. Now I'm going to harden your heart. You have lost your chance to repent. So this is the time of his visitation. When Jesus came, that was the time. God had visited them, but they did not get it. They did not understand it. They did not believe in it. So Jesus wept because of that.
Look, in Luke chapter 19, verses 42 through 44. If you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they had been hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you on at every side. And they will level you to the ground and your children within you. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. Jesus is talking about the future destruction of Jerusalem. Okay. And this happened exactly like that, like Jesus said in AD 70, right? The Romans came and killed everybody. They cut open their guts. You know why? Because uh, they heard rumors that they said that uh, the Jews were hiding their wealth, like their gold coins, by swallowing it. So after not just killing them, after they killed them, they would cut open their guts to see if there had, they had any gold coins within them, right? This all happened because it says, you did not recognize the time of your visitation. In the Old Testament, the 10 plagues were a sign of the coming of God's visitation. And when Jesus came, the 10 plagues, all of the elements of the 10 plagues were already happening in the world, in Jerusalem, in Israel at that time. And Jesus was curing people from those 10 plagues. And when people saw that, they should have recognized that God had come into this world. So we need to do the same. We need to now recognize. Are things like the 10 plagues happening to us right now, happening around us right now? Are there deceiving spirits? Are there people who did not receive the love of the truth so they fall into the deluding influence? No matter how hard you try to but convince them they won't believe in God, right? These things are already happening to us right now. So what we need to understand is that the time of God's visitation is close. And if you don't recognize that time, it's the same thing that happened 2,000 years ago to Jerusalem could happen to us. So today, we're going to end here with, boiled, uh, with plague number six. We'll continue next week with number seven. But I hope all of us will take this a lesson to heart, and look around. See if the signs of the time of his visitation are around us. Okay, And we need to be prepared for that. Let's end by reading first or 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 6, verse 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. For he says, at the acceptable time I listened to you, and on the day of salvation I helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Amen. Right? So our chance to repent is not going to last forever. It's now. We, when we have the chance to pray and repent, we need to do so every day. That's why our senior pastor, our founding pastor used to say, you need to repent quickly. Whenever you remember if you've done something wrong, do it right there at that moment. Don't put it off because you never know if that chance will come back. Okay. Now is the acceptable time. This is a time when God is hearing our prayers. So I hope and pray that during this season of Lent that we will pray, we will repent, we will be renewed so that our spiritual eyes will be open so we could see what's going on around us that the 10 plagues are already happening. The time of our visitation is at hand. So we need to be ready and prepared. Okay, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for the Bible study you have given to us. Father God, help us to open our eyes of faith and our spiritual eyes so that we may be able to see and recognize the 10 plagues that are happening around us. Help us to know and be aware of the time of our visitation and help us to be prepared first and foremost, through repentance and renewal and through prayer, and also by just feeding ourselves with the word of God daily so that we could be prepared for the, word, the famine of the word that is to come. Father God, I pray that you will enable all of us to be armed with the love of the truth so that the deluding influence will not affect any of us, but that we may always remain in the truth and in your word so that we may be protected like Goshen was for the Israelites and like the people who were in Jesus Christ were protected 2,000 years ago. We thank you so much and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
skip glory to God with our applause. Wait one second. 